Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad uh, you could be with us this evening. Uh, this is the, the second uh, of four sessions uh, of this uh, season's winter lecture series, uh, this year entitled Pandemics Old and New. Uh, and again, we would ask you to shut off your sound and video during the presentation. Uh, you, you might do that right now. Uh, and uh, last week, uh, uh, you may recall, we um, had the uh, uh, Bob uh, um, Poussin uh, will monitor the chat feature that, and you can submit questions uh, uh, by um, uh, activating the chat command at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and uh, at an appropriate time or at the end of the presentation, uh, Bob will communicate those to us. And there may be, even be time at the end for you to unmute yourself and, uh, uh, and activate your image and present your questions uh, uh, directly. Um, our presenter this evening uh, is Dr. Ali Khan. Uh, Dr. Khan is uh, an internationally recognized physician and scholar in the field of infectious diseases. He is currently uh, Dean of the College of Public Health at the Uni University of Nebraska Medical Center, a position he's held since 2014. Prior to that, he was the Director of the Office of Public Health Pre Preparedness and Response at the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and before that, numerous leader pos leadership positions at the CDC in a variety of different programs. Uh, Dr. Khan's career has taken him all over the world in the fight against the spread of disease. He was involved in combating Ebola in West Africa and SARS in uh, the Far East. These and other uh, efforts are cataloged in his book, The Next Pandemic. I guess I can put in a plug here. The Next Pandemic on the Front Lines Against Humankind's Greatest, uh, greatest Dangers. In addition to reviewing past efforts at fighting disease, the book examines where the future pandemics are likely to originate from mutations, uh, from spillover from uh, other species, from lab accidents, from bioterrorism, and from natural disasters. Published in 2016, it strikes a prophetic tone uh, as the COVID pandemic has emerged costing millions of lives with a, title, with a final fold yet, uh, toll yet to be determined. Uh, Dr. Khan's scholarship is further revealed in over 100 scholarly articles and policy papers. He has also been in the forefront in developing strategies to help others combat disease. He designed the laboratory component of the CDC's field epidemiology and training program. He assisted in the design and implementation of the CDC's component of the White, House, uh, White House's malaria initiative. He is also the inventor and director of Biofusion, a project that combines multiple sources of information for improved awareness and timely sharing of information tie tied to global health. This evening, he will share with us regarding various threats to global health, health and the role of the uh, World Health Organization in dealing with them, an, an agency that, is, that he has worked cooperatively with. So with that, let me uh, welcome on the behalf of all of us, uh, Dr. Khan to the program and turn it over to him. Dr. Khan. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much. That's a very generous uh, introduction and I'm humbled for the opportunity to chat with you uh, this evening. So what I'd like to do, if I may, let's see if I can share my screen. Okay. Can I get a thumbs up or uh, good to go if people can see my screen? Excellent. That works fine. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, what I would like to do this evening with you is talk about emerging infectious diseases. And needless to say, I'll spend a chunk on uh, COVID-19 and the disease it causes, which is SARS-2. Um, uh, SARS and then um, I'll transition from there to talk about WHO and the role of WHO in the world and some of the challenges with WHO and then end up with a few final uh, thoughts. Uh, this is more true, a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. I hope this is a lesson that we will not forget anytime soon because this is not the last pandemic that we will experience, uh, probably even within our uh, generation. 
So here's a quick outline of what I'll be talking about. How do we get to where we are with this COVID pandemic? Um, WHO's roles and challenges, and I said some final thoughts. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, if you haven't figured that out yet. I speak very fast. If people would like me to slow down, please say something or drop a note in chat. But my guess is you probably hear as fast as I speak. I always like this slide uh, because, gosh, wouldn't it be great if all we had to worry about was the common cold these days? But every other day, there seems to be some other brand new emerging infectious disease that we happen to be talking about. Uh, and it isn't coincidental uh, or random. Um, ever since, let's, about, let's say about 12,000 years ago, when man decided that uh, they were going to give up hunting and gathering and become farmers, that dramatically changed our, our uh, relationship with infectious diseases in two ways. One is that the moment we started forming little towns and silly cities and villages, there were enough people to spread disease from person to person to person. And so if you were hunting and gathering, there would never have been enough people to sustain a disease like measles, for example. Uh, many of the islands, uh, for example, let's see, two years, a year and a half ago, I was in Fiji responding to the measles outbreak on Fiji. Those islands don't routinely have transmission of disease. They have outbreaks when it's introduced, but they are not big enough from a population standpoint to sustain the disease. The second thing that happened about 12,000 years ago is we started to domesticate animals. And when we started to domesticate animals, then the diseases of those animals could infect humans. And those are called zoonoses. And those diseases have been the greatest killers of all time uh, for humans. So smallpox, for example, was likely from rodents that as we started to store grain the rodents would hang out around the grain and we got infected with smallpox virus. The same thing uh, for distemp uh, uh, measles virus, so which is animal equivalent is distemper virus that we got it from animals. So domesticating these animals was a source of disease um, for us. And that stayed true uh, for the last uh, 10,000 years uh, or so. And every now and then, these sort of diseases that occur all the time that are sustained in humans, we would see a large pandemic often from an animal source. So the top right, you have picture of Black Death, mid 1400s, that was plague, that was obviously fleas on rodents that also infected humans, and then humans sustained the disease from person to person uh, from respiratory plague. Uh, about 100 years ago, 1918, uh, we had an influenza pandemic uh, in the worldwide. Um, and this pandemic was also due to waterfowl. They're the natural hosts of influenza viruses infecting a human and then causing a global pandemic. And I never, ever forget HIV when I talk about global pandemics. Uh, it's very easy to think of it now as a disease uh, that's uh, gen generally spread from either heterosexual uh, sex or from men who have sex with men. Uh, and in the past from blood donations and IV drug, and still somewhat now from IV drug use. But I like to remind people that that was also a zoonotic disease. This was a disease of non-human primates that spilled over into humans um, in Western Africa. And then uh, obviously from Africa made its way to the rest of the world into what we know as this horrific disease called HIV AIDS. So another global pandemic. Uh, this slide here breaks every rule of slide making too much, can't read it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's the purpose. Um, and this was, um, when was this, 2017? The purpose of this is to make the point that we continue to have these emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that we see every year, drug-resistant malaria, you'll probably see Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, Zika virus, Ebola, et cetera, et cetera. So these continue uh, as either small clusters or outbreaks or even epidemics in specific countries. And this should not surprise us, given what I have mentioned about zoonotic diseases. So when I teach uh, emerging infections to my students, I usually classify the factors that lead to these emerging diseases into three categories. 
and everybody is always anxious about category one, right? That's the microbial adaptation. These are the, uh, you know, microbes that are all of a sudden uh, no longer susceptible to the routine antibiotics, for example, and people like to talk about microbial adaptation. I always like to remind them that actually humans are very different now. So 100 years ago, we would not have had a whole lot of people with either HIV or on chronic uh, dialysis who are more susceptible uh, to infection or uh, bone marrow transplant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that students are always excited about that. But then that actually is a minor reason for why we are susceptible to these emerging infectious diseases outside of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, a bigger factor is ecologic factors. So these are changing ecosystems. These are extreme weather events. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, fellow citizens in Texas uh, experienced that. Uh, last week into this weekend uh, with an extreme weather event uh, that tragically, unfortunately, had them without power and uh, many without water for days on ends. And uh, with climate change, we should continue to expect those sort of events to increase. But the biggest factor for why these emerging diseases exist is because of us. All right, social, political, and, and uh, economic factors. Uh, globalization and travel and trade, people, goods move very fast, uh, war and famine, political instability, neglect. It's because we fail as humans to do what, need to, what needs to be done and what's needful that we have pandemics. So maybe not the initial outbreak itself, uh, that could be nature work uh, at action, but anytime you have a pandemic, that is a specific human failure uh, for a pandemic. No other reason for it. So the, bur the burden of large epidemics, uh, it's easy to key into the health impacts, you know, 500,000 unnecessary deaths in the United States from this pandemic. So sickness, death, long-term disability. But I think it should be very clear to everybody listening to me today that in addition to the health impacts, the economic and social, and I should have put the word political impacts, of these pandemics are bigger than the health impacts. Uh, we could clearly have imagined different election results in the US and elsewhere if, it had, if there had been a different response to the current pandemic. But we all have recognized, even if we're fortunate enough and blessed enough that we may still be employed and have a house above our heads and food on the table, there are many people who aren't so blessed. Um, and so there's been a significant disruption of our social lives um, with the mental health impacts of it and uh, of this pandemic. So one year ago, so let's think, beginning of 2020, as we were all making our fun little New Year's resolution, nobody thought that they were going to be sending, spending the next year. And now it looks like you know, it's already a year and a half in one of these lovely little uh, movies. Take your pick, whichever a zombie virus pandemic movie you want to uh, is your favorite. But essentially, we have been living this life for the last um, 18 months or so. Well, not 18, but getting on 18. So this is where we are with COVID-19, 13 months, I guess, into the pandemic. Over 110,000 global cases, over two and a, two and a half million deaths. Uh, unfortunately, the United States, which has had the poorest response, 25% uh, of deaths, 20% uh, of deaths, 25% of cases, while accounting for only 4% of the global population. Uh, this is to show you where cases are occurring worldwide. I do this for two purposes. One is to make the point it's a pandemic and by definition pandemic means disease everywhere. Uh, ignore the fact that there's little disease in Africa. We now have more and more evidence that there's very little surveillance in these countries. So no surveillance, no disease. Do pay attention to the fact that countries like China, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam have zero to no, no cases every day. So there's about 1.7 billion people right now who without a vaccine go about their day without any cases and they can't remember the last time they've probably seen a death. 
So the lesson from this is the lesson I made earlier, and I hope one that will stay with Americans and a global community, which is that we decide not the virus. Pandemics are a, are a human phenomenon. They are not a biologic phenomenon. Uh, and in the East where they tested, traced, controlled their disease, uh, they have little to no cases and deaths. That is not true for numerous countries in the West that delayed, debated, and essentially divided their communities uh, in a response and fought each other instead of fighting the virus. You'll see here in the United States, we have this quite unique, um, and I've never seen this before, to be honest with you, and I've been doing epidemiology for over 30 years, almost 30 years, and it's a stair-step outbreak. So this was the first step, uh, but we never go back down after the first step, and then the second step in the summer, and then the third and fourth step, and it's been so gratifying to see the dramatic decline in cases that has happened since we peaked in early January. Unfortunately, we still have twice as many cases now as we did back in uh, even early fall, let alone uh, in the summer. So still a fantastic, fantastic number of cases uh, occurring, but gratefully, far fewer cases, far fewer deaths, far fewer hospitalizations uh, in the United States. So it looks like we may have uh, turned a corner, although I'm very careful about that uh, statement. So it should be no surprise to anybody that COVID was a uh, virus of the year. I don't know if you can be pers person of the year, although I do believe viruses are alive. So COVID-19 was the person of the year last year. Um, Here's a quick, I think I'll do this very quickly on COVID itself because I see your fourth talk is somebody who's specifically gonna spend more time talking about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. But the essential thing is that these are a large family of viruses. Many different species are infected with coronaviruses, including us. So many of our cold viruses are coronaviruses, but these are special coronaviruses that are animal coronaviruses that have been associated in the past with SARS, so that severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003, uh, the very small outbreak uh, worldwide now, less than 10,000 people, less than 1,000 deaths, and MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Virus, this is associated with Campbell, camels in the Middle East. And now we have SARS-CoV-2. This is the big cousin of uh, SARS-CoV-1 that caused the disease in 2003. And unfortunately, there's no immunity between uh, these strains. So your cold that you've had or have had multiple times, the reason you have it multiple times is there's no immunity, but it doesn't protect you from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the disease is transmitted through coughing, sneezing, talking, and breathing. The major way it's transmitted is droplets. This is about 80% of all transmission is likely uh, through droplets, if not more. And then a small amount is transmitted through contact. This is contaminated surfaces, probably an even smaller amount through aerosol. So these are these little tiny particles that get airborne. So the difference I tell people between droplets is that's gotta be in front of you and aerosol would be around the corner, right? A droplet will not infect you around the corner. And there's some increasing evidence that this is found within your feces and maybe there is some transmission uh, through feces. And if somebody wants to ask during the question, question answer, we can talk about feces and how that's actually a way to surveil for the disease and find it in different areas by looking at uh, sewage plants. So typically when you get infected with COVID-19, there's anywhere from a seven to 14 day incubation period. And what makes, uh, so this, this gives you a typical you know, incubation period, you start feeling bad, you're sick, you get severe disease, you go to the ICU and you either die rarely, hopefully, uh, or you get better and uh, uh, come home. Uh, the thing that may, has made SARS-CoV-2 so difficult compared to SARS-CoV-1 is this piece. And that in yellow that says critical 48 hours. And it looks like while you are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic is the better term, you are transmitting virus. Uh, and that is why we ask people to wear masks, even they think and feel, think they feel 
fine. They may actually be infected and be shedding um, virus. So that's the part of the source control part of wearing a mask. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 was predominantly a disease of hospitals because people became increasingly infectious as they got sick and hospitalized. But this is what has bedeviled us with SARS-CoV-2 is that you're infectious before you may well feel sick. And so this pre-symptomatic transmission has really been a problem. So who dies in America? Essentially uh, obese elderly males uh, is who dies in America. And there's a very clear step up as you get older and older that your risk of death goes up. If you see here, there's a um, there's a kind of a cutoff at 65 years of age, and 80% of all deaths in America occur in those 65 years of age. So my hope and belief is that now that we're vaccinating nationally, everybody over 65 and older, that deaths will become increasingly rare in America, because that should take care of about 80% of the people who die. And then we will move from there, obviously, to people with other underlying chronic conditions. And hopefully by the summer comes around, death will truly become a rare thing uh, in America. And that, that would be a great day. What are the other risk factors for severe illness? Uh, heart disease, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. Uh, we have seen that there's a marked increase in hospitalization and deaths amongst these individuals. And these are the individuals that we will recommend get vaccinated if they are um, between 16 and 65. I should have put smoking on there too. So smoking is a risk factor also uh, for severe disease. Now, unfortunately, um, while the majority of people who get infected will do well and will not die, which is great news. The unfortunate thing is that we now know even those who survive, even with mild disease, they may have long-term effects. You may have heard this described as long COVID or long cohort, long COVID, long haul syndrome. There's a couple of different terms that people use uh, uh, and banty around. It's really a post uh, a post-infectious COVID syndrome, and there's multiple components to it. Some of it is just chronic sequelae of being, getting infected. So I categorize those into heart, lung, kidney, and brain uh, damage that we know can happen. And at least three to six months out uh, can occur. And as we accumulate more data, we'll know how chronic some of those uh, conditions can be. I worry a lot about kidney damage, for example, because that can have lo severe long-term consequences. Uh, but there's also another syndrome, this long, uh, long COVID syndrome, that is associated with severe fatigue and brain fog. Uh, we see this after other infectious diseases. It's called the post-infectious uh, syndrome, uh, fatiguing syndrome. So that's not unusual. Uh, what is unusual, obviously, is with, uh, with millions of people infected, there's a lot of people uh, with this illness. So there may be lo multiple long-term consequences that outweigh uh, some of the acute consequences uh, of this illness, obviously not outweighing deaths. But uh, to claim that this is only a function of who dies and otherwise everybody does fine really short changes this tragic disease uh, in our communities. So let's transition. Uh, so I always like to keep a theme of hope within all of my talks. Uh, so let's talk, a and one of the components of hope in my talks is the tremendous progress that was made by the United States and a number of other diseases on therapeutics, treatments, and vaccines. Uh, and so we now have good options, uh, at least for therapy for individuals early in your illness. We have these great monoclonal antibodies later in your illness. We have dexamethasone, which is a steroid for you. So that's really good news in terms of treatment. And it's even better news uh, in terms of vaccines. Uh, now, I can show this at various places. Let me show this to you here. So people really have been concerned that maybe the vaccine was rushed too quickly or there were corners, cutting of corners. And I'd like to use this slide to remind everybody that there were no cutting of corners that occurred. We still had the typical phase one, phase two, phase three studies. These were all able to be accelerated because we had an existing vaccine platform uh, and we had tons of money 
uh, we need to we need to credit the previous administration for the significant resources that they made available and the relationship with FDA to work as a partner to look at data in real time, including data. You know, they moved away from things on paper to electronic data reporting. So all sorts of mechanisms to make sure that the vaccines that became available were not just safe and effective, but to me, the most important part of that is is trust. Right. So if you have a safe, effective vaccine that nobody's taking, you might as well not have a vaccine, which would be true. For example, we used to have a Lyme vaccine that nobody trusted, so it's off the market. So fortunately, the FDA followed the process. These drug manufacturers, there was more transparency with this vaccine than with any with these vaccines than with any vaccine in the history of mankind. You can actually go online and review the original study documents. Th these are proprietary. Nobody shares those documents. But for the sake of transparency, all of these were shared with the American public so that they could trust the vaccine and trust the process. And because of the wonderful effort by not just the United States, I got to be careful, you know, worldwide effort around vaccines. We have numerous vaccines are in various stages of development from just putting it in a person or two to phase three trials of tens of thousands of people uh, who are being tested. And fortunately, we now have both authorized and approved vaccines depending on what country you're in. I always like to show that there's abandoned vaccines. And you'd go, well, Ali, why do you want to show that there's abandoned vaccines? And for me, this is a part about trust, to remind people that not any vaccine got approved, that many vaccines, including two by Merck, which is a big uh, producer of vaccine, uh, never made it into human, uh, never got approved because they just didn't work. So one more piece of information to remind people that not everything got it th got through the system. You really had to be safe and effective to get through the system and be approved for use. Maybe I can come back to this. This is a this is a description of how the various vaccines work, whether they're an adenovirus vector, an mRNA vector. If people are interested, I'll come back to this because it's a it's a it's it's kind of fun, but a little bit sciencey. But fortunately, we have these two mRNA uh, messenger RNA vaccines available. Both are very effective, both approved for people either 16 or 18 years of age. Very few to minor uh, to rare, I think, side effects is what's being reported with these. So two great vaccines, a reminder for all of us to get out there, get vaccinated as soon as we are eligible to get vaccinated. Uh, we have high hopes the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, has been submitted to the FDA for approval. The hope is that at the end of sometime in the next week or so, that this will also be approved. This will be a game changer. It's a single dose uh, vaccine as opposed to the two dose uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. The US has already contracted to buy 100 million, of them, 100 million of them. And I think by the end of February, anywhere between two and 12 million doses are immediately available. So we'll be able to scale that up uh, very nicely. And as you can see with one dose, even though the efficacy data for mild and moderate disease may not be as impressive with two doses with Pfizer and Moderna, recognizing that if Johnson & Johnson got two doses, they'd probably be in the same position. But out by 49 days after vaccination, uh, nobody dies. And that is our goal, nobody dies. So a vaccine where nobody dies is a good vaccine. Please go out and get this one too, if that's the one that you're slotted to get. Uh, there's a fourth vaccine that we've also bought, the United States has also bought, uh, which is the Novavax vaccine. This uses old technology, but who cares, it works. And hopefully as they can, continue with their phase three trials sometime in January, February, March, sometime in March, hopefully March, April, they'll show their data to the FDA and this will be yet another vaccine that will be available to Americans and the global community, which takes me to the global community. So while some countries are very fortunate in having vaccine available to them, unfortunately, that's not true worldwide. And at the current pace of vaccinating, I think globally we're doing about 6 million doses a day. It'll take about three years and eight months to vaccinate the global uh, community. Uh, that's too long, given how interconnected we all are. 
and we will need novel strategies to get more people vaccinated faster if we want to completely reopen our global communities, reopen um, travel. So hopefully there will be a lot more going on in terms of sharing of intellectual property and increasing uh, production to get more people uh, vaccinated. And as long as we're talking about global, we might as well transition at this point to the World Health Organization. Uh, summary slide, I'm sure everybody on this call is aware that uh, the World Health Organization uh, is a product of World War, post-World War II politics and creation of the United Nations, 194 member states. So this is a member organization uh, with uh, regional offices. And I take a lot of pride in the fact that PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, uh, for this region actually predates WHO itself. And PAHO is an amazing organization in its own right. So here's the mission and priorities. You can read them faster than I can speak them. Uh, uh, but the priorities are health for all, health emergencies, with a specific focus on women, children, adolescents, and in the impact of climate and environmental change. This is obviously a novel uh, addition to the WHO mission and priorities. Here's their core functions around leadership, research, norms and standards, policy options, technical support, and monitoring. So this is the core six functions of WHO. And WHO has been an amazing global organization uh, with eradication of, of smallpox, a declaration on primary health care, eradication of polio. Soon they will eradicate hopefully guinea worm and eventually control river blindness worldwide, has been responsible for the advanced uh, expanded programs on immunizations, saving millions of lives around the world from diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, et cetera, et cetera. The framework convection on tobacco control. Uh, this is an amazing global health agency that is providing significant global, obviously the global leadership for health and significant support four countries worldwide to achieve their health objectives and to respond to public health emergencies. Uh, Dr. Tedros, the WHO director, has, when he took office, also laid out his triple billion target for the agency of 1 billion more people with universal health care, 1 billion more people protected from health emergencies, and 1 billion more, excuse me, enjoying better health and well being. So that was his uh, target. That said, there's a growing challenges for WHO. Uh, this, I, I just outlined a scope of responsibility that's tremendous uh, and grown over time. You know, I spoke about climate change a second ago, but that's not stayed um, true in terms of on track or aligned with its budget, which has been flat or reduced. There's very little flexibility in what WHO does with its budget. They are also, trust me, I go once every other year for a WHO mission, uh, cumbersome decentralized and bureaucratic governance structure. And they're a very difficult position of both being a technical agency, but being a political body that's responsive to its members. So this puts it, to be very honest with you, in a difficult position. And I have wondered many years uh, whether or not WHO is really the right agency to help respond to emergencies. I thought this was a little fun. Uh, social distancing would help you rewrite a whole lot of <laughs> book titles. All right, so going back to these diff this difficulty for WHO and the challenge for WHO. So WHO, you know, it can be an advisor, it can offer guidance uh, for lots of different things and it has the authority to declare a public health emergency. However, it has no power to impose public health policies on national governments. So, and no enforcement powers, it can't independently investigate things in countries. So this is a real challenge for this agency and for whatever agency we choose in the future to help us respond to the next pandemic. Uh, the other big challenge for WHO is funding. There's lots of different ways to say this, but the best way is just the pie graph, which is less than 20% of their funding is from assessed dues and the rest is all voluntary. So think about an organization with such a mandate that's really 
doing it, the majority of its work with just voluntary donations that can come and go uh, at any time. Uh, the US is the largest funder of the WHO, and this is by treaty uh, as how our contribution is defined uh, and our 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 mandatory mandated dues are actually a small part of the our total voluntary dues uh, that the US gives to WHO every year. As everybody knows, the previous administration suspended support for WHO and not just financial support, but all support for WHO. And then on the first day of his office, the current administration reversed that decision. Uh, and will be support, not just funding WHO, but supporting WHO and its global mandate. Uh, here's a look at where other sources of funding for WHO go from the US, mainly through CDC and other parts of HHS. But you'll see that, uh, and hopefully, I hope there's a lot of pride in the room, in the rooms, I guess this is not one room anymore, all the, all the rooms listening to this on Zoom, I hope there's a lot of pride in you for what the US has been doing to help polio eradication uh, worldwide. And we're a large supporter of polio eradication. And then obviously other, uh, health issues, but this is what U.S. money is going to do worldwide, working through WHO as the implementing partner. Let's end, well, I guess two endings. One is the uh, uh, WHO, and then I'll finish with some final thoughts. So let's end the COVID pandemic and WHO response. So this is the WHO response, and WHO has gotten a lot of, I would say, uh, appropriate criticism for its response. Uh, so China first reported a cluster of pneumonia cases in December 31st. Uh, this is despite the fact that on December 27th, they already knew they had a novel cor coronavirus causing this disease by next gen sequencing. Uh, and so, and it wasn't until I think the 11th that they admitted that this was a coronavirus. Um, and WHO, did not declare this a public health emergency uh, due to Chinese government pressure on January 23rd. This is despite the fact that disease has already spread, I think, to two or three countries at that point. On January 30, even WHO could not keep its head in the sand anymore, and they declared the coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern. And then they were way late again, declaring this a global pandemic, even though the disease had spread months earlier, had a month earlier to multiple uh, country, multiple continents, which is the definition of a pandemic. Uh, and then on the 24th, they pledged to do something or other, uh, equitable distribution of vaccines and medicines. For anybody who's interested, you can Google WHO, um, emergencies uh, and see a day-by-day -day timeline of everything WHO has done for the pandemic. So it's actually quite interesting because it gives you a real nice timeline of the pandemic and the various WHO responses. <coughs> WHO once again has in other public health emergencies after they got past these initial issues with China has been invaluable as a source of information for the global community on how to respond to this pandemic with daily press conferences from Dr. Tedros and Dr. Mike Ryan uh, on how to respond. They've deployed teams worldwide to help provide assistance and they established the ACT Accelerator to make sure treatments, tests, vaccines, were available globally. One piece of this ACT accelerator is COVAX, and this is a global vaccine alliance to try to develop and manufacture enough COVID vaccines to guarantee everybody in the world gets equitable uh, COVID vaccination. And our current president committed $4 billion uh, against this, making us the largest donor to making sure the world has uh, those who are not as fortunate as the U.S. have access to vaccines. So I hope another point of pride uh, for you listening into this on the U.S.'s support of WHO and of global health. That said, you know, we talked about some of these shortcomings, lost opportunities to adopt basic public health measures, et cetera, et cetera. I've talked about some of these. Uh, already, and there are a number of panels underway to think about how are these addressed so that we're ready for the next 
uh, pandemic because it's still the same WHO. Um, and then lots of news out there. Uh, I would say that WHO's res initial response coupled with the US initial response has led to most of the disinformation we see worldwide around this uh, pandemic, but I'll leave that to another lecture or talk. So here's some final thoughts uh, as the evening closes out. So the good news is the US has turned the corner. We have abandoned the herd immunity, infect everybody strategy of the last administration to the new protect everyone strategy of the current administration based on vaccine. And hopefully we will uh, come back to the control triad. We know how China and Vietnam and Australia got their cases under control. It was with data-driven evidence-based leadership. Uh, test, trace, isolate, and quarantine, which is the number one strategy that the U.S. has never adopted. And finally, community engagement, which is mandatory mask wearing, uh, which I believe there's still 14 states that uh, do not believe in that science. Social distancing, or these are the non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, and hand washing. And so a combination of these strategies well, hopefully, because of these, I hope we have turned a corner in the US. It looks like we've turned a corner in the US, so that's good news. We just need to recognize that there is a small dark cloud out there about turning the corner with good public health measures, increased vaccination, and that is there are these variants of concern. And we know these variants of concerns are 40 to 65% more infectious, depending on the one you are. And now there's data suggesting that at least one of them is 30 to 40% more deadly, uh, which is a main one circulating in the United States currently. So hopefully we will continue to take good public health. Oh, I think that's my next slide probably. Yes, that's my next slide. So hopefully all of us are invested in this fight to get this disease under control and we'll do our part with continuing masking, hand hygiene, social distancing, please get vaccinated. Uh, and then all of us coming together, we will be able to drop disease transmission in our communities and get back to a better normal uh, here in America and worldwide. Uh, but what I must admit to you is you know, it's, uh, this is the current pandemic, there is a next pandemic. And this was not even the worst pandemic. So when I wrote this book, for me, number two was SARS or MERS as, a, as the next pandemic. The biggest concern continues to date for me remains an influenza A virus, uh, uh, like 1918, that poses the greatest threat for us. And then there's a number of other potential threats for us from a virus standpoint. And that's just from a, from a infectious disease standpoint, there are still other public health threats around climate change, bioterrorism, the emerging infectious diseases and the unpredictable future. But let me leave you as always with hope, right? So let's think about all the amazing things that happened because of the COVID-19 crisis. The response from our sci scientists that helped develop uh, these wonderful therapeutics, the, the selfless dedication of our healthcare workers worldwide, many who not just risked their lives, but died to save uh, their uh, fellow man and the selfish de dedication of our you know, essential workers. Who are these essential workers? Uh, truck drivers, grocery stock, uh, uh, stockers, people in uh, meat packing plants, you know, the our farmers, all these people who didn't have the option, like I'm blessed to be able to sit here in front of you and talk to you on, on Zoom. Lots of these people, unfortunately, didn't have, didn't have that opportunity. And many of them unfortunately died because they couldn't Zoom into their call. So they're the true heroes of this uh, outbreak. And finally, um, uh, excuse, excuse me for that. Uh, finally, uh, hopefully our lifestyle has changed to make us practice better public health hygiene, to make us better appreciate the work of our public health uh, employees across all of our local and state and national health departments and our healthcare workers and our essential workers and help us appreciate all them better now than we have ever in the past. And then finally, I spell hope with a U and the U is obviously for you. Uh, and so I, if nothing else, 
uh, if you don't become politically engaged, become science, science literate and promote science literacy, this is my slide I use for my disinformation talk. I do hope that you will be a hope super spreader. You know, we have COVID super spreaders, but we need more hope super spreaders in our communities. And what better than you and your faith as a faith-based organization to help spread hope. Thank you, everybody. All right, Dr. Consul, I have some questions here from the chat. Uh, the first one, <clears throat> excuse me, is from David. He says, in retrospect, could this pandemic have been predicted? Why didn't this disease remain as a localized epidemic to Asia? The finger pointers blame the government's inability to anticipate worldwide disease. How does one differentiate between the ability to spread internationally or remain more localized like the bird flu? Did most of infectivity arise in the United States from Europe rather than Asia? Okay, that's a great question. So yes, we could have predicted. We had, you know, it, it's called SARS-2, which means there was already a SARS-1. Uh, so, and the SARS-1 actually had, uh, there was a SARS-1B that people don't talk about uh, that also occurred. So we could have predicted that this disease was going to happen and will happen again, right? This is a disease in the natural environment will once again come into humans and, uh, I'd like to remind everybody these hundreds of millions of cases worldwide were caused by one person, right? And so that's potential to happen again. What's important is for countries to have systems in place to initially recognize this cluster and then sh and shut it down and share information with everybody immediately. So think about how different the response would have been if China immediately, instead of hiding this cluster, had promoted this cluster, told people that this was a new SARS coronavirus, shut down its borders, and we all locked down our borders immediately worldwide until this is this had gotten under control, would have been very different. Then let's look at the response of South Korea to the response of the United States. They both countries saw the case on the first day. South Korea called in all of their manufacturers and said, we want you to start creating dozens, tens of thousands of these kits so we can make the diagnosis. And then we are going to find each and every case with contact tracing. We're gonna move them out of their household if they're positive, And we're gonna keep an eye on their homes for quarantine for 14 days. The US did not take that approach. We took a different approach, which was the herd immunity approach. Uh, and so we have a different outcome than South Korea, which has very few cases and hardly any debts to the position in the United States. So yes, this could have been predicted and this could have been prevented. This next question is from John. Uh, he asked, why would side effects be more pronounced for the second as opposed to the first injection? Oh, I, so can I wave my hand on that one? So for the first one, I had um, a sore arm. I couldn't lift it above my shoulder. And then for the second one, I had low grade fever, chills, headaches. My tummy was upset. So the reason it's more, not, nothing serious, obviously, right? <laughs> I'm fine, right? The reason the second time is more is because you've primed your immune system. So the it's actually, I, when I, when I was complaining about my side effects, uh, my friend said, well, congratulations, you had a great immune response. So that's why the second vaccine may, may cause a little bit more in terms of side effects. It's because you've primed your immune system and the second time around, your immune system is like, I know what you are. <laughs> it goes looking for it. So it's all good news. It's all good news about the second dose. So please get your second dose. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, this one from John also, what is the probability that delays in vaccinating the world will allow the variants to become more potent? John, that is an absolutely excellent question. So the variants are a function of the herd immunity strategy. So uh, coronaviruses, like other viruses, they're very, they, they have sloppy sex is the best way to put it. Right, So they don't reproduce themselves exactly every time and they have these little mutations happening. They do it a lot slower than influenza viruses. They actually uh, mutate a little faster than coronaviruses. But if you don't get the coronavirus under control, then all of a sudden you have a lot more of it. There's a lot more time, a lot more people infected. And that's the environment that allows for these new variants 
to uh, pop up in. So is it a surprise that the new variant is in countries like the United States, the UK, Brazil, and South Africa? And I think there's uh, potentially in Germany. There's, so it should not surprise you that the variant didn't show up in China, Australia, New Zealand. They have no cases, they have no variants. So letting the disease go unchecked created the environment for these variants, which is why I made the point that we in the United States need to get vaccinated as fast as we can, take all the appropriate public health measure protections to get disease way down. And the lower the number of cases, the less likelihood that these variants will spread or you will create new variants. And why we need to be partners globally since this talk is also centered on WHO and why the current administration has lined up to support COVAX to make sure that globally you get this disease under control because what you don't want is you think you've got the virus under control and then you know there's a new cycle of another deadly version that comes out after you comes you know comes behind the last one that is not protected by the vaccine you already have so you could find yourself in a vicious cycle as we are with influenza unless you try to get this under control all at once. This next question is from Priscilla. She asks, will the COVID-19 vaccine be something we have to get every year like a flu vaccine? Priscilla, that's an excellent question. And until we get this disease under control, I think you may be spot on that, you know, we already have suspicion that at least the South African and the Brazil variant and the UK variant, there's a variant of the UK variant called the Bristol variant. They are all having this convergent evolution to becoming a type of variant that may not well respond very well to the current vaccine. So Priscilla, I think that's a great question that these variants may eventually diverge enough that the current vaccine and therapeutics are not effective and you need to get a booster vaccine against the new variant type. Think flu model. Uh, John asks, are we to make anything of charges that WHO mishandled the COVID-19 crisis? No more so than what I just, uh, what I mentioned during the course of my talk. I'm a big fan of WHO. I hope you picked up on that. Uh, they're an amazing agency. They do amazing work. And there's really some of the best public health experts in the world work for them. But there's no doubt that they sit in a very difficult position of being technical agency and being a political agency. Right. And it does them no good to yell at China because if for COVID-19, because then China, the Chinese government, not the Chinese, because the Chinese are as much as victims of this disease as anybody else. So I want to be very careful. This is about the government, not the amazing Chinese people. Uh, but the Chinese, but you can't have a, you know, a, a food fight with the Chinese government on COVID-19 because tomorrow you're going to be talking to them about influenza, about uh, sexually transmitted diseases about universal health care, about polio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it puts, it puts the agency in a very difficult position. And I think they need to be completely restructured or, or preparedness needs to be pulled out to a different agency with a different, different set of global guidelines that allows a, an agency to ask the hard questions and say the hard things when a government is not doing the right thing. Uh, Priscilla asks, is the WHO separate from the UN or part of the UN? Uh, so the WHO, uh, no, it's part of the UN. Like you uh, think of uh, World Food Program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a UN agency. Elaine asks, um, didn't the Rotary fund polio vaccination worldwide? Yes. Uh, big fan of the Rotarians. Anybody who's out there, a Rotarian, thank you very much. Uh, feel a lot of pride for what you've done, not just Rotary, but also the Gates Foundation. There's a large number of other funders for polio worldwide. And polio now is cornered in two countries in the world, India and Afghanistan. Unfortunately, this pandemic has slowed down some of those efforts. But I'm sure hoping in the next five to 10 years, we can put a tombstone on polio the way we put a tombstone on uh, smallpox. Doug and or Lois asks, how does the ProMed global alerting system work? Did, drug, did, did Doug ask that or did Lois ask that? It says Doug slash Lois, so I'm not quite sure which one. Well, I'd have a different answer if it was Doug <laughs> or if it was Lois, but okay. So <laughs> how, how does a global uh, reporting work? The ProMed global reporting system, alerting system. 
ProMed. Oh yeah, ProMed. Uh, ProMed is a is a private organization. Uh, people uh, they they scan newspaper articles and they put them up uh, for people's uh, uh, review. So that's that's how their alerting system works. They just look at newspaper articles and reports that people send them worldwide. Uh, David asks, are we convinced that the underlying problem for the pandemic is a zoonosis from the open market selling bats? Was the alarm sounded by Taiwan consciously ignored? I think our government has admitted that it is financially supported by vir virology programs in Wuhan. Why would we support investigation of such a dangerous virus? Okay, so these are three questions there, okay? Uh, so let's go through them one by one and remind me of them. So the first is, we support research of dangerous viruses all the time so that we learn how to make them less dangerous, so that we're aware of them, so we can think about therapeutics, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and help improve our learning and surveillance for these diseases. So that's good news. We should be doing that. We should be doing more of that. And this uh, is not making things dangerous. This is understanding why they're dangerous, right? I would never propose that the US should fund making things dangerous, but we should always fund finding why things are dangerous and how to make them less dangerous. Uh, yes, this is a zoonotic virus. We have lots of sequence data that proves that this is a routine zoonotic virus, bat-borne zoonotic virus. Probably the intermediate host for this was a pangolin uh, is what it looks like based on the nearest relative. Before it went into a human, we saw the same thing with the original SARS virus. There are also bat viruses, obviously, but the intermediate host was likely a civet cat that was sold at market. Uh, uh, I don't remember who asked this, who asked this question. Was it John? David. So David, we don't know it was that Wuhan market. I'll be very honest with you. That Wuhan market to me looks like a super spreader event in December. Whatever the event happened, likely happened in mid-October, early November that caused this outbreak. Uh, and so that's where that interaction happened. Maybe in that same market, maybe in some other market, maybe out in the wild. We don't know what that interaction was. And then somehow that disease got into the Wuhan market either again or for the first time and caused that super spreader event, which let us recognize that original cluster of cases. Priscilla asks, uh, will we be wearing masks on a regular basis going into the future as in every winter season? I sure hope so, Priscilla, because what I did not show you was the influenza data. There is no flu in America right now. That is, and there has been no flu starting in the Southern Hemisphere starting last year. That is amazing news, right? Because flu also kills 40 to 80,000 Americans every year. And I am for anything that kills less people. Uh, so there you go. If I had a simple mission statement, kill less people, right? And so if in the summer people, in the winter, if people wore masks to help protect others, that would be absolutely great. And if nothing else, you know, when I talk about the better normal, one of the things I'd like to see in the better normal is nobody sick comes to work anymore. And I hope we see things underway that allow for paid sick leave routinely, no matter what your income level is. And that if we can keep sick people out of the home, and if those who are ill or may think they're ill or even potentially be ill are wearing masks, I would like to see that continue to depress uh, um, flu within communities. Dave asks, should the Biden team push for change at the top of the WHO since there was too much deference to China? Oh, Dave, I think that's a good question. I don't, you know, so I've spent a long time in the preparedness world and the longer time I spend in the preparedness world, I look less at pointing fingers at people and more at looking at systems. So I don't think it matters who the head of WHO is. And uh, I think the real issue is what is the system that allowed this to happen and how do we fix that system so it doesn't happen again? I don't think just finding a scapegoat solves the problem. Not that Dr. Tedros would be a scapegoat, needless to say. I think he did a great job given the circumstances uh, and has been very bluntly honest when need be. I really think, David, to me, it's about finding why did the system not work and how do you put in a better system that serves mankind 
for the next pandemic. So for example, China still has never shared a single original isolate of this virus. So yes, thank you very much for sharing the sequence. But you know, from you know, on January 30th, when you said, hi, we have this disease, you know you have 30 people with infection. Why, why were samples not going worldwide on, on, on December 30th? Apologies. On December 30th, January 1st, why were you not FedExing, you know, nasal swabs, throat swabs, blood samples, et cetera, et cetera, worldwide to a key set of laboratories and say, find out what this is and fix this. Well, they already knew what it was, but that's besides the point. But find out what this is, find, you know, and help us fix this working together as a global community. So David, I say it's about systems. It's not about people at the end of the day. People come and go, right? It's To me, it will always, always be about systems. Uh, John and Glory ask, how do we prepare for the next pandemic? Today, there was news of a new avian flu possibly in Russia. Yeah, H5N8. Uh, so I think there's numerous lessons from the current pandemic to help us prepare for the next pandemic. Uh, the first is around surveillance, right? Uh, or detect, disease detection. So what systems do we have in place to make sure we're monitoring for these out, uh, these sm in individual cases, small clusters, outbreaks as they occur? What sort of risk assessment process do we have to see whether or not this is a threat? What sort of response do we have to these immediately to see if we can shut them down early before uh, they get bigger? And what sort of global coordination is there to make sure that we're working in lockstep to do all of this together. So, and there's probably lots of other steps to that. Obviously, I could go through all sorts of the preparedness uh, capabilities that would be necessary, but that's a start. Um, John asks, why the poor response to COVID by the WHO? I think we've covered that already, John. I don't, I, I, it's, it's about the challenges of WHO's role as a technical agency and as a member state uh, agency. And uh, again, those poor response that's limited to the first, you know, first 60 days or whatever until they, by the time they called it a pandemic, they've been on track since then. And they've actually had, I would say, a spectacular response to WHO. Uh, uh, after you discount those early uh, stumbles and missteps by WHO, the ACT Accelerator is a great example. I mean, all these countries in the, in the uh, low and middle income countries that got diagnostics that they wouldn't have gotten, technical expertise they wouldn't have gotten a global um, uh, trial to look at therapeutics uh, that doesn't exist and soon with COVAX to get vaccine to a lot of these low and middle income countries that wouldn't have gotten it. So WHO is a shining knight in this uh, outbreak, to be honest with you. a couple of dents in its armor, but no doubt a shining knight in this outbreak. Mike asks, how likely is it that a person who is fully vaccinated is unable to spread the virus to people who have not yet received a vaccine? Likely, very, very likely that they're not going to spread the vaccine. Most of our most of our vaccines, when they prevent you from getting infected, they also prevent you from shedding, uh, and so you're unlikely to spread disease. So I would not let that concern hinder me from getting vaccinated. I'd still advise you after you get vaccinated, please continue to wear a mask, social distance and hand wash until cases get way down in the community. So continue to do your part. Uh, also recognizing you're doing your part from the flip side, which is no any vaccine could potentially be overcome by somebody who's really, really infectious, spending a lot of time with you. Uh, David asks about the most effective future diagnostic testing, a nasal swab versus a rectal swab. Nasal swab versus a rectal swab. It depends on what purpose you're trying to serve. So some of the rectal swab issues have been about long-term shedding. Uh, you don't need a rectal swab to make an acute diagnosis. And actually, even past nasal swab, you may be able to use an oral swab. Uh, the work that I've done with the Major League Baseball, we ended up using uh, saliva. So it may not even be a nasopharyngeal swab or nasal swab. It may be a saliva saliva. Uh, sample. So those may be better options for acute diagnoses. A rectal swab may serve some purpose for long-term shedding and other uh, reasons, uh, but I think we're good currently with the strategies we have for diagnostics. Douglas asks, how much would U.S. deaths be reduced by early use and improved mask use by the public? 
Oh, it would be dramatically reduced. We we know 80, I think the last estimate was 60 to 80% of deaths in America would have been averted with an appropriate public health response uh, was what the Lancet article was. Please don't hold me to that. I, I don't have the Lancet article in front of me, but I'd ask if David asked that question. David, there was a recent uh, WHO Lancet uh, article that reviewed these issues. And so I would go to the Lancet article and look at what those numbers look like. But there would have been a dramatic decline in the US if we had adopted universal masking early. Gary asks, because of the work with mRNA vaccines, will that platform make it easier and even faster to prepare vaccines in response to the next pandemics we are likely to see? So Gary, you saw I was excited by that question. I agree. I think the mRNA technology, we already knew that it looked like it was going to work for flu, but this could be the way to think about new vaccine development in the future. And it also would be invaluable for an emerging infectious disease because all you need is a little snippet of the of the genome and you could potentially start creating antibodies very fast. Craig asks, is there anything to be done to make the CDC less politicized? Uh, yes. Uh, um, that's a really, that's a very insightful question. Thank you for that. Uh, how do you make CDC less politicized? Uh, I think one way is like the Fed chair. You just make it a six-year appointment. Make it a bureaucrat, six-year appointment. Uh, I'm not sure any president would ever allow us to do that again, but I think that would be pretty awesome. Is it's, it's just some uh, you know good public health scientists who knows public health potentially move their way up through the ranks. They get a six-year appointment and then they're out, and then somebody else comes in after six years, and then they're not worried about somehow being linked to the current political uh, environment. Although I got to be honest with you, it's very hard to separate politics from public health, right? A, a function public health policy is always a mix of politics and public health science. In the in what we saw last year was a corruption of that process, where the public, where where public, where uh, politics was the only thing that was uh, influencing public health policy and it was no longer public health science. So politics will always be part of public health and for good reason, right? If, if we're going to ask people for mandatory vaccination, that's gotta be a political decision, right? It's politicians that understand the will of the people and understand how they can best meet the needs of their constituents. I, you know, pol public health practitioners aren't elected officials, right? Politicians are elected officials. Uh, so there will always be a mix of politics in public health. But I think you can make CDC a lot less political by uh, making, uh, making the CDC director a uh, fixed appointment and by fixing CDC's sal budget once and for all. Uh, so that they, like WHO, are not sort of uh, victims of an ever-changing strategy around dollars and what the pet project and what the pet thing is. Just give them a chunk of unencumbered dollars and say, do the right thing. Roger asks, if China is not held accountable now, what prevents them from again subduing critical information about potential health scares? Nothing. Okay. Elaine asks, will the U.S. ever have universal health care? And then Priscilla added, is the WHO working on the U.S. for us to have universal health care? So WHO, as I told you previously, has no authority. Uh, I wake up every day with a dream that every American will have access to health care. Uh, and I think it's tragic that of 36 high income countries, we are the only one country without universal health care. That we think that there are people, citizens, our friends, our families, friends, neighbors, who are not worthy of having uh, care access to a physician for their diabetes or heart disease or cancer. Um, I, think it's a, it's, I think it's an American tragedy that we don't have universal health care in America. There's multiple models for universal health care. Uh, there are single payer models, there are multi insurance models, there's a Canadian model. There's multiple ways we could have universal health care. But really, the first thing it takes is you, the people on this call, to demand universal health care at, at the state level. Uh, you, in your own state, you know there are challenges with. Uh, getting access to individuals and at the national level, 
to put people in place who will ensure universal health care. Think about how different this pandemic would have unfolded if people had universal health care, if they didn't have to worry about going to work and losing their job. David asks, is nationalism a potential problem with the sharing of vaccines with other countries? Is nationalism a potential problem? Uh, I think you, you should ask somebody who's better versed in political science than I am uh, with this. Invariably, every country is gonna try to secure as much vaccine as they can uh, for their own uh, countries. And that's what we're seeing happening worldwide. I think uh, for me, the answer, this goes to my strategy about public health, which is, I'm not in the business of cutting up a pie between different groups. I'm in the pie making business is how do we make more pies? So is nationalism a, 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 a problem for sharing vaccine or is our inability to share intellectual property so that any country can make its own vaccine if they want to, is that really the problem? And giving them the res other resources to do it. So those of you who follow me on Twitter, uh, wait, no, this is my, this is my official CDC. Yeah, forget about that. Uh, uh, official UNMC uh, talk, forget about that. But I have said previously that we should give the schematics for mRNA vaccine and the process out like uh, free to anybody in the world who wants it. Peter asks, after the 14 day waiting period following the second vaccine, is it safe oh. to eat in restaurants, go to concerts, kiss grandchildren, et cetera? So again, it's safer than it was before you were vaccinated. I would still advise caution for lots of reasons. There's a lot of disease currently in our communities. And even though you are protected uh, at to a 95% level, it's not 100% protected. And any vaccine can, uh, will not be effective if you're around, you know, if you're spending a lot of time with somebody who's really infectious. So please go about your lives as you wish, but do it with good precautions because, uh, and maybe have a little patience until we get disease as low as possible within our communities. Uh, I hope I don't mispronounce this, but Barry asks, how many of the 37 vaccines are likely to be ultimately approved? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. And that's a good thing about the process. You can't predict it. Otherwise, Merck right now would have two vaccines uh, available to them. So sorry, Barry, no way to know which vaccines are going to make it. The good news is that thanks to good old ingenuity worldwide, there's a lot of vaccines in, in trials. Uh, and hopefully more, many of them will make it past phase three trials into people's arms uh, as approved vaccines. Priscilla asks, what is a good resource to learn about universal health care to be able to advocate and communicate with politicians about universal health care? Oh, there's, Priscilla, there's numerous resources around uh, universal health care. There's a, there's a couple of websites that, again, I, Priscilla, if you want to drop a note to my official account, I'll give you a link, but there's lots, there's lots of sources about how this is, would be so easy to get to do in the United States. We would actually save money in the United States if we had universal health care. Uh, Barry asks, do you see any chance that medical groups like the AMA start to push for universal paid sick leave? I would hope so. It's uh, it benefits it benefits them uh, because then all of a sudden people will come in for sick care. <laughs> Carolyn asks, how effective is taking vitamin D three for the second shot? A friend said that that was what she was advised to do and not take Tylenol. Uh, okay, I, I wouldn't understand why if you had low grade fevers and chills, you would take vitamin D3 instead of Tylenol. Uh, vitamin D3 has never been shown to be effective in that uh, as an anti-inflammatory. So I, I don't understand the science behind that, sorry. Gary asks, after 30 plus years of AIDS, and even though there are great treatments, is a vaccine possible in the next few years? I, so hopefully if nothing else, while I may be bluntly honest, I hope people picked up that I, I wear uh, rose-colored glasses. So I, I'm optimistic that, you know, we will one day get a vaccine to this virus. I mean, why not 
uh, and uh, there's got to be a way. We do know there's a handful of people who have survived the disease, uh, have been cured without bone marrow transplants. Uh, so how do they do that? So there's there's got to be a way to, if it can happen naturally, even extremely rarely, there's got to be a way to duplicate that uh, with the vaccination strategy. So I'm optimistic, but I'm always optimistic. And our last question from the chat, Harry asks, how well does the plasma from people exposed help those infected? So this is controversial. Um, and I'll keep you out of the controversy and basically say there's no longer a need for it. There are now excellent monoclonal antibodies. So this is when you give somebody plasma, you're giving them antibodies. But now there are these synthetically prepared antibodies. There's two different, is it, have we gone up to three different companies? There's two different companies that have these great antibody products. They actually have more antibody product than there's people who want them. So don't worry about plasma anymore. Uh, if you think, if you're at high, if based on your age and condition, you think you're at high risk and you think you're infected, please get diagnosed immediately and ask to get your monoclonal antibody. It'll save your life. So well, don't worry about plasma anymore. We have the monoclonal antibodies, which are a much better option now. We've got one more question that came in last oh. in the chat. Uh, Joe asks, I took acetaminophen before my first Moderna shot. Did this cause a problem? Probably not, but we recommend that people don't take, it, take uh, drugs before their shot because it could potentially dull their immune response. Uh, so if you're gonna take it, take it you know, the next day if it's a big problem. Uh, uh, but you know, I told you I had, I was, you know, you know, I had this little low grade fever and chills and muscle aches and stuff like that. I didn't take anything for it. It just went away. All right. I'm going to let everybody turn their videos on and unmute themselves if they have any other questions since we've had all the questions in the chat. And I'll turn it back over to John also. Well, we've had quite a few uh, questions through the chat mechanism. Maybe we can handle uh, two or three uh, additional questions from someone who wishes to unmute themselves and, and show us who they are. Uh, are. Are any uh, out there, uh, any additional questions out there? I'd like to shoot one additional question having to do with these lingering impacts, uh, especially I'm interested in impacts on the brain that uh, follow from the infection. Is it just a lingering inflammation? Uh, what else is going on? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. There was a recent paper that looked at the uh, fluid that surrounds the brain, suggesting some sort of ongoing inflammation uh, around the brain of a small, this was, gosh, it couldn't have even been six people or something like that. But uh, this, is, this is just new data rolling in now that there may be some sort of chronic inflammation. We do know, and this was disturbing to me, that likely when you're, when you're infected, the virus may eventually start living in your gut uh, and start pushing out these little not not complete virus, but like pieces of virus. Because you've heard of people who can have and who can have be positive for testing weeks later. So what that is is probably them still pushing out little pieces of virus because some virus is living and happy in their gut. So depending, and there's this, always been this issue about gut-brain access, and I think that may be some of what's going on is the gut-brain access in these individuals who are having sort of brain fog and all the other uh, symptoms uh, associated with this post-COVID. But again, I'm I'll be very honest with you, I'm completely speculating here. Uh, very limited data, and hopefully as the data comes in, it'll become more clear what some of the reasons for this may be. Squeeze in more, one more question. H have you seen anything like the Kawasaki syndrome that you've been describing in children? Oh, very nice. So David, uh, you seem to remember that my early work was on Kawasaki syndrome. Uh, so yes, there is an equivalent in kids. It's called MISC, multi-inflammatory syndrome of children. And we seem to see this. Uh, we've seen it here in Nebraska, obviously. We see it worldwide. Uh, if you have enough cases going on of COVID, you'll see this in kids. And for some reason, they get this bizarre inflammatory illness that's not 
that's independent of COVID, likely after they get COVID, they get this inflammatory illness and they see some of the same things we see in Kawasaki, which is inflammation of coronary arteries uh, and other inflammatory uh, inflammation of their vascular uh, system. And so this is tragic and continuing to occur. Uh, this is another byproduct of the um, uh, uh, last administration's herd immunity strategy. The more cases you have, the more you're gonna see of MIC. C. Thank you. More questions? Well, from the, uh, the feedback we've started to receive through the chat mechanism, uh, Dr. Khan, you did an outstanding job this evening. And uh, if, if people can react with a thumbs up, uh, please do so. But if they can't, let me offer uh, my thank you for sharing your expertise with us this evening. And, and we wish you well. Thank you very much and have a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.